as we meditate, we're working toward two things. One is stillness, the other is discernment. And they go together. They're not two radically different processes. Because after all, to get the mind to settle down and be still, you have to discern what's going on in the mind. And to discern really clearly, you have to get the mind to be still. And it's not a catch-22. These two sides develop gradually. It's not an all-or-nothing kind of affair. As the mind gets gradually more still, you gradually see more. And as you see more, it enables the mind to get even more still. You simply find yourself leaning to one direction or the other as you practice. It's like walking. You lean to the left, you lean to the right. You lose, use your left foot, use your right. for whether you start out with your left foot or start out with your right. That's not something you can choose. When you sit down, you may find that the mind is ready to get still, so you just follow it, allow it to be still. Other times it's not. So each time you sit down to meditate, take stock of the mind. How is it doing? Is it feeling inclined to settle down? Or is it not? And if it's not, what, it, what is it getting worked up about? What thoughts are preventing it from settling down? You have to work with those first. And how do you work with those thoughts? Try to make yourself a stranger to them. In other words, when you see the mind inclined in a certain direction, ask yourself, why on earth would you want to think about that? Allow yourself to be surprised. Look at things with new eyes, like a scientist. Who takes a common assumption and questions it. Isaac Newton. Back in his days, it was believed that things fell because that was simply their nature to go down. That explanation of it's their nature to do that covers up a lot of ignorance. So he asked, well, why did they go down? They came up with an unusual conclusion. Say with the apple. Well, apparently he didn't really watch an apple. But suppose there's an apple that falls from a tree. Not only is the earth pulling the apple down, but the apple is also pulling the earth up a little bit. But since the earth is so much bigger, it's the apple that falls. It wasn't the nature of matter to go down necessarily, it's so the na nature of matter to attract. Of course, we still don't understand that attraction. Einstein came along and said, well, actually, it's a warp in space-time. He threw, took a number of other basic assumptions and questioned them, too. And it's when you question your assumptions, that's when you see new things. Because for the most part, we don't even see our assumptions. A thought comes up about something that would be good to eat or good to see, and we immediately say, well, it must be good to eat, it must be good to see, it must be good to think about. So ask yourself, why on earth would I regard that as good to eat or good to see? Why should I be thinking about it now? Pose that question in the mind. And see what comes up. Sometimes the simple act of 
putting that little question mark next to your thought is enough to kill it. It's the kind of thought that survives only because it's subterranean. As soon as it sees the light of day, it dies. Like certain worms that live underground. As soon as they're exposed to the outside air, they die. Other thoughts, then, don't die quite so quickly. So you have to keep probing, well, what's the underlying assumption here? And as long as you're dealing with a thought that has a pull on the mind, but without allowing yourself to get pulled along with it, there's a chance you'll see some interesting things. And when it finally strikes you that the thought is strange, doesn't really have that pull anymore, then the mind is ready to settle down. Again, you can use your discernment in the other way to remind yourself of why you are wanting to settle down. What's to be gained from getting the mind still? And there's a lot. You see things more clearly, you're less a slave to your thoughts. The mind gets to rest. We use the mind all day long. Even when we're asleep, we dream about all kinds of things. The mind needs time just to be by itself. Then you'll find after a while that it gets tired of being still, wants some more action. So again, question that. Or make use of the mind's willingness to think by actively questioning whatever else is coming up. So you see, it goes back and forth like this stillness. Questioning, stillness, questioning. Sometimes the mere fact of stillness it allows you to see things you didn't see before. But you can't always trust whatever comes up in the still mind. One of John Lee's techniques for testing insights is to say, well, to what extent is the opposite true? For example, you start seeing how inconstant things are. He says, well, look for the aspect that's constant, or the stressful. Look for the aspect that's pleasurable, and vice versa. Things that are not self. All too often we believe that if our insights fall in line with what the book says, then they must be true insights. But you can't always take that for, for certain. Turn around and question them. Flip them over. See where the opposite is true. And that way you, you add some nuance to your insights. And it protects you from running away. Because this can often happen. You get an insight and it starts adding on to that insight and connecting with this insight, and all of a sudden you find yourself way off in the Andromeda galaxy, far, far away. From what's actually going on. The whole point of insight is you want to be able to watch the process of thoughts arising in the mind, to see where there's the intention element to go with the thought. That's where the definement will be hiding out. Why do you want to go with a particular thought? What's its appeal? This is why the Buddha said, seeing things arising and passing away is only part of insight. The other part is to see their allure. Why do you like the thought? What pulls you in? Then look at the drawbacks. What happens when you get pulled in by that thought? And finally, what understanding allows you to escape, escape from it? something that's not arising and passing away right now, you can just put it aside. Look for the things that are arising and 
nibbling away at your concentration, or actually blocking your concentration. Because those are the important things to analyze. We can read about how everything in the world is in constant, the trees are in constant, the mountains are in constant. But if you're not attached to the trees and the mountains and they're in constant, it doesn't really mean anything. It's not the issue. It's where you're trying to find your pleasure, where you're attached. That's what you want to analyze in these terms. Because that, again, those ways of analysis make you a stranger to your thoughts, which is precisely what you want, to see them with new eyes. Suppose someone else were looking in your head and watching your thoughts right now. What ask him? Why are you thinking that? Why are you thinking this? Try to be that stranger. So you don't simply take your thoughts for granted. You take your assumptions, which are contained within them, all your defilements. Don't take them for granted. See them as strange. See them as curious. Why would you believe that? Why would you want that? Why would you like that? And when you gain some insight, question that as well. Until the mind has had enough of this questioning and it's ready to settle down. So you find your meditation leaning a little bit to the left, leaning a little bit to the right. And that way you walk along. And you find that the breath is an ideal place to do this walking. Because you can use the breath as an object to just settle down and be still with. And you could also use it as a, a grounding for your analysis. When a thought comes up, notice how it affects the breath. Or when you breathe in a certain way, notice what it does to the mind. If you can locate the part of the body that's tensed up around the thought, we'll breathe through it. See what that does. This way you can walk on your breath. When you use lean towards investigating, questioning, or you can question the breath, or use the breath as a, a handle for the questioning. Lean toward the right, get the mind to settle down, be still, and can use the breath as a means for settling. For fully inhabiting the present moment. Remember that the meditation has these two sides, and it needs both in order to be complete. The Buddha never made any radical distinction between the two sides. He says, to get into jhana, strong absorption, you need both tranquility and insight. And again, insight, you need jhana. They're all part of the same whole. It's simply that you'd be leaning in one direction or the other. But he never has you hop all the time on one foot. But whichever foot you start out with and however long you spend on either side, that's up to you. Learn how to read the mind and its needs. And you find that the meditation will take you where you want to go.